This podcast is part of the Big Heads Media Podcast Network. Go to BigHeadsMedia.com for more great podcasts. And now, on with the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to... We're watching here! We're watching here! This is Opinionated Movie Talk with Chris and Perry. My name is Chris Williams. With me, he is the contagion to my outbreak, Perry Cyber. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'd much rather be contagion than outbreak. Yes, I think everyone you. would be. Uh, well, welcome I, back. I, I think so, too. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> to if you, you look, as well, and to all our listeners. Thank yes. Thank you for returning. It is season two, and this is not how we expected to start season two. <laughs> so no it is not um you know when you're a movie show uh you kind of expect you'll be able to go to the movies and <laughs> can't do that right now but perry how are you doing how are, are you keeping safe and healthy and everything yes thankfully everybody in my universe is is healthy and well and good and secluded and uh we miss we miss our extended family greatly but we are uh, uh talking to them more than ever Right, that's great. We are. Uh, we're hanging How about in, you? Yeah, we're hanging in there. We're uh, my wife and I are both working full time from home with two young kids, so uh, that's been its own little special challenge. But um, you know, we're all healthy. We uh, we have yeah, you know, we have work coming in, so you know, we're, we're doing best case scenario in a worst case scenario right here, and so it's good. We're getting to know each other a lot better, and. Uh, you know, it's it's nice not to have the morning commute, so I won't lie about that. <laughs> but, um, yeah, to all of you listening, if you've listened to us through Season 1, welcome back. Thank you for being patient through the break. I had to get school out of the way. We had a few other things to get out of the way, but we are back for Season 2. If you haven't listened to Season 1, go on back in the archives. We have some really great shows to listen to. Um, I, I'd really recommend our our two-parter on the best movies of the decade. I really liked our first episode, um, Cinematic DNA. Uh, Perry, did you have any you'd want to recommend? Or? All of them. All of Each them. Each and every one of them. You have no excuse, people. You, there's <laughs> nothing to do. You got all the time in the world to catch up on everything we've already done. Absolutely. And it's free. There's no <laughs> paywall. Come on aboard, people. That's right. That's right. Um, well, we can't get out to the movies now, but we figured a fun way and a just probably a kind of meaningful way to kick off this second season would be to talk about going to the movies. I miss going to the movie theaters. And so we're going to do a whole episode devoted to the joy of going to the movies. We usually start with a section of what we're watching. We're going to catch up on quarantine viewing in a few weeks here. But Perry, what was the last movie you saw in theaters before the world went crazy? The last thing I saw was The Invisible Man. Oh, oh. I've actually heard good things about that. I've been considering running that. Uh, okay. (laughs) (laughs) I I heard lots of good things, too. And I really love Elizabeth Moss. But, uh... Uh... I I was... I I was... I was underwhelmed. (laughs) Oh. But then again, as we've talked about many times, I'm not a horror guy. So okay, it, maybe okay. if you were a genre enthusiast, it will play really well for you. Uh, I just it, – it's that problem for me where like the character is already distraught and at the end of her rope at the beginning of the movie. Okay. So there's nowhere to go yep. emotionally. And then the gimmick – you know, the, the the effects that they can get away with now are obviously a lot cooler when you know when when an invisible man is beating the crap out of you and throwing you around the room it looks a little more realistic i got to admit and yet at the same time i was giggling inside i'm like this, this looks <laughs> ridiculous <laughs> not that the effect is bad just that it looks weird there's if there's a there's a <laughs> i didn't even think about this till right now there is a there's a thing if you if you're deep into the world of professional wrestling and at one point I was, you could, uh, you can learn that there's, there's a, there's a thing. It's popular in Asian professional wrestling where there are guys that specialize in wrestling invisible opponents. What? This is a thing. Yeah. This is a thing. It's a dude wow. alone in the ring, but he's, you know, choreographed it. So it looks like there's someone in there with them. That's what I realized I was watching. That maybe that's why I thought it was funny. <laughs> that could very well be the reason. 
Oh, wow. Wow. Um, now, it can't be worse than uh, Universal's other attempts to kind of get these characters back off the ground. Did you see The Mummy with Tom Cruise? I did, I, I did not. Uh, yeah, I, I remember that was the whole Dark Universe. They were setting that up, that it was going to be... Yes, they were. And they had Russell Crowe, you know, explaining, like, is kind of like Fat Nick Fury, setting everything up. And, uh, <laughs> wow, I, that fell apart really quickly, and we got Elizabeth Moss instead of Johnny Depp, which... I mean, even uh, if the movie's not that great, that's got to be a trade-out. Yeah, I, and I, I don't want to imply that it's a terrible movie by any means. I just – there's, you know, boy, there's a reason it came out in February. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I'm saying. <laughs> well, I, you know, now that I think about it, I think the last movie I saw in theaters, which I should say is, due to school and everything, the only movie – I've seen in theaters in 2020. I think it came out the same day. I think they were both Valentine's Day releases. The only movie I've seen in theaters this year, and if this keeps going the way it's going, it might be the only movie I see in theaters this year. <laughs> I-, I took my son to see Sonic the Hedgehog. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, okay. Yeah. Uh, How'd that play? Um, well, I will say in all honesty... This is the very best movie you could probably make about Sonic the Hedgehog. Um, you know, it's, it, it is exactly what you think it's going to be. Maybe a little less annoying than I had predicted it was going to be. Um, I, I mean, it's, it's a blue rodent from another who, dimension who runs really fast and they, I mean, it writes it, itself. It, it really does. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's not awful. I mean, I've seen movies that have driven me nuts before. I, I really thought Sonic was going to be like the Poochie movie because Sonic the Hedgehog is kind of like Poochie from The Simpsons. And <laughs> Ben Schwartz kind of dials it back a little bit. So it's not as, you know, it, it's not the nails through my ears that I thought it was going to be. Um, James Marsden does what he can with it and he has kind of a fun chemistry with, with Ben Schwartz and, it made it kind of painless while at the same time it's the only movie I've seen in 2020. And I keep thinking about that as, is that is my legacy. That is my letterbox score staring me back. Um, I, I really like Ben Schwartz. And that was why I was like, that made me like doubly not want to see it. <laughs> but if you're telling me that he's okay, I would actually sit through this. He's he, there's, yeah, he has a nice little chemistry with uh, James Marsden, and it makes it a little more painless. Um, I will also say Jim Carrey is going for it in this, and I don't know whether that's a good or bad thing, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I I was the right age for Ace Ventura and Dumb and Dumber and, and all that, and he's doing that energy of comedy, which to me was kind of like, all right, I haven't seen this in a bit. Okay. And, uh, yeah, that was basically my thing. It's Sonic the Hedgehog. It's fine. It's Sonic the Hedgehog. It, it is totally Sonic the Hedgehog. Yes. It yeah. couldn't be more Sonic the Hedgehog. The Absolutely. Movie. It, it's Sonic the Hedgehog. Have you ever wanted to watch Sonic the Hedgehog but not play the game? This is the <laughs> movie for you. <It's... laughs> yes, yes. You are watching someone else play the game for you. And uh, with more <laughs> fart jokes than are in the game. So... So, uh, that would improve the game. Yeah, my I'll son. Be honest, I... My son loved it, so I will. I will, you know, give him that. I'm glad he had a good time. And uh, so I, he gives it three farts up. I got it. That's good. That's exactly what he should be giving it. Yes. Yes, three farts and a burp. So uh, that's really kind of <laughs> kind of the eight grade eight year old uh, eight year old rating system there. So. Perfect. Hey everyone, Chris here. We're going to take a quick break. We're actually going to do that twice through this episode. As Perry and I talked about how much we love going to the movies and how much we miss that experience, we realized we wanted to do something to help our local movie theaters. Not only does this pandemic mean we can't all go out and do the thing we love to do, but it means there are owners and employees of independent theaters who have lost their ability to make a living right now. I'm based out of Detroit. Perry is in the Ann Arbor area, and we were thrilled to be able to connect with two theaters and talk to them a little bit about their love of movies, as well as some of the ways you can see a movie and still support these theaters from your home during the COVID-19 lockdown. First up, I had the pleasure of talking with Elliot Wilhelm. 
Elliot is the director of the Detroit Film Theater, which is part of the Detroit Institute of Arts. If you haven't seen a movie here, I highly recommend it. Their presentation of the Oscar-nominated shorts every year is fantastic. Uh, it has a gorgeous screening room. It's in one of our country's great museums, and Elliot's a fantastic curator. I've had the pleasure to take classes from him at Wayne State, and I can safely say that there are few people as knowledgeable and passionate about film in the Detroit area, and there are probably even fewer who can talk about the subject with as much humor and insight as Elliot. So here is a brief chat with Elliot Wilhelm. Elliot, how are you holding up with the, uh, with the lockdown lately? Well, uh, by being uh, distracted, and uh, the way to do that is to is to find movies that uh, we want to show, movies that we want to show virtually, um, and movies that we're uh, you know, looking to to present in different kinds of series to form after all of this is over. So it keeps my eye on the future, which I hope um, is going to be as as bright as I believe it to be. Now I understand that even in lockdown, people can still view films from the Detroit Film Theater, correct? Yes, um, we are a part of a growing universe of virtual screening rooms uh, that are popping up around the country and I'm assuming around the world. Uh, many of these are kind of channeled by the art houses that are currently uh, locked down. And it's a way to serve our audiences, our regular audiences, and produce a little bit of income so that we can be there. Uh, we can have our staff, we can have the people we need, people we love who have helped the DFT uh, to grow over the years, still on board when all of this ends. And it's a way uh, to still be able to curate, to select from all of the films that are out there and available now virtually for private screenings, uh, either on a computer or on a, a television device. Um, it's, it's no real substitute for the genuine article, and that is seeing films in a theater, but it is better than not seeing the films at all. And well, there's quite a uh, interesting lineup there. What are some of the films you're most excited about people running out to see or running to their uh, laptop to see? <laughs> Sorry, walking to see. Right. Um, well, I, I'm very, very excited about the film that we opened with, which is still running. Um, that was Ken Loach's new film called Sorry We Missed You. Uh, and Ken Loach, of course, makes lots of films about the labor situation uh, in the United Kingdom and how difficult it is to eke out a living in that particular economy for people who are not a, of a certain education level, perhaps. But in Sorry We Missed You, it's an exceptionally prescient movie. It's about a delivery man who, who takes packages from door to door and is in real need of, of a way to make a living. But it's about that gig economy that can be pulled out from under you at any time. And this film was, of course, made um, before the virus struck the world. But it's a, a very dramatic example of the rug being pulled out from a lot of people. And this movie, which is set on a human level, it's, it's not a political film in the sense that it's diagramming the situation. It's showing what happens to a, a perfectly kind and wonderful family when they are in economic circumstances that are terrible and are beyond their control. Uh, so I, I think it's a film that's going to generate word of mouth. I want to make sure that it's around for a long time. So that one is going to stay available uh, to DFT uh, viewers uh, for some time now. That sounds great. I really want to check that one out. There was also uh, the Pauline Kale documentary I want to I want to check out. Uh, that started last week, I believe. It's, it's the best movie documentary ever made about Pauline Kale. So all I can say about that statement is that it is, of course, the, the only movie ever made about <laughs> Pauline Kale. And it is a kind of conundrum to make a, a movie that that moves quickly and that engages a, a new young audience about the craft of writing and about the craft of writing film reviews specifically that are based on feelings and that take a long time to read and to digest when she's really onto something, when she was really onto something like her something like 13 page review of Bonnie and Clyde that appeared in 1968 um, in The New Yorker and and so many of her other extraordinary pieces. And she was an exceptional person as well. I had the privilege of meeting her 
um, more than once. And she was very funny and, and fascinating uh, to listen to and absolutely the most brilliant person I've ever discussed movies with. It's, and it's not about uh, do you agree, do you not agree? She had this gift and taught me an enormous amount and a lot of other people who have made movies um, and, and shown movies and just like movies about how to articulate, how to put your finger on that thing about a film. Um, I, I, I liked the movie. I liked the idea of the movie. I know I should really like the movie, but something bothered me. There was some reason that I didn't buy into it. Pauline Kael could put her finger on that and explain to uh, moviegoers who, who may not know all about technique, and it's not really about camera angles or, or, or you know, quick editing or um, any of the techniques that a, a lot of hate to say film students, but sometimes film students will talk about when discussing how a film works or doesn't work. She talked about why you felt the way you did about a film. And in doing so, she taught a generation of people about how movies work. Um, and that includes people who had no intention of going to see the films that she, she talked about. They just loved her column. And so to make a documentary tribute to her is something that's been long overdue, and we're really happy to be able to have it on our, our screen, however virtual it may be. <laughs> now, where can people go if they want to learn about what they can view and how they can help out the Detroit Film Theater? They can go to the DIA website. Um, sometimes there's a little bit of navigation required um, because everybody, the whole world, including the DIA, which is a museum that now has doors closed to the public, physical doors, so in order to, to find out how the new DIA works and is interacting with the community around us, we'll take a little bit of digging on our website. But if you find a way to Detroit Film Theater on that website, and it's not that difficult, you click on it, you'll go there and you'll see the films that are available to you for home viewing in any given week. Um, and uh, we try to have an array of films, at least one new movie a week with descriptions it's it's a kind of a virtual dft brochure um but uh, without problem parking you, you can simply click on it um pay the money that is required for a virtual ticket watch it with as many people as you are locked down with and enjoy i would also recommend too the dia's newsletter has been great coming into my mailbox each week with some really Really great tips for watching movies with the kids, or you've written a few things about things you can find on the Criterion channel, uh, which I've enjoyed reading. So I, I'd also recommend people check that out as well. Sign up for that that reading list. Elliot, one thing Perry and I are talking about this week on the show is this celebration of going to the movies. And if you had to pick one thing that you're missing right now about being able to go to a theater, what would it be? Well, I, I wear a couple of hats. Um, one of them is a person who runs a movie theater um, at the DIA. And the pleasure of that is to be in the theater and listen to the audience uh, respond to a film or not respond to a film, um, as the case may be, uh, but to enjoy themselves as, as a group and to talk about a film afterwards and to you know, argue with each other or, or come up and talk to me about the film. That's one experience. That's a movie theater that I'm in all the time. On the other hand, going to the movies as a patron is still the most exciting experience for me. And um, in addition to just going to, to ordinary movie houses, which I love to do, the ex experience of going to film festivals can be uh, a really, really wonderful thing, uh, refreshing and energizing. And there was a, a festival I used to go to. I haven't been since 2008, but went for, for decades without missing one. Um, and that was in the mountains of Telluride, Colorado. Um, the Telluride Film Festival brought out a lot of amazing archival films, some new uh, independent films. Now they're a little bit more Hollywood-oriented, and it, it's become less interesting to me. But it's one of the most beautiful places in the world, in the, in the Rocky Mountains. And nobody really cared about these fabulous vistas because we were all in a theater and that first day when you know that you have nothing to do except go to the movies for the next three or four days from morning until night and the first one turns out to be good, 
Uh, there is a, a kind of joy about that, that that makes you feel, I have found where I'm supposed to be. Um, and I love being a presenter. I love showing films. But what I love more than anything is that feeling of getting into my seat, lights go down, uh, all my hopes get raised again. I, I'm still not cynical. And the the thrill of having that experience um, and, and then talking to people afterwards in the audience, that's still the greatest thing. It has not diminished. And I'm using that festival as an example, but you could say the same about any festival and you could say the same about any movie theater, any mall theater, art house, doesn't matter. If you have a great experience in the room, uh, it, it stays with you forever, as does where you encountered that movie for the first time. So it's a it's a lifelong um, best best time at the movie theater experience for me. It's always happening. And finally, is there one movie that you remember seeing on the big screen that you're like, I love this experience. This is an experience I will remember for the rest of my life. Probably um, when I was five years old, my parents, who always took me to inappropriate movies as a, as a little <laughs> child, took me to see Rear Window. Um, not a good thing to do for any kid. Um, so here I was at the age of five, and I was told later on that I, I began crying halfway through the picture and had to be taken out. But I always remembered what I was crying about, which was that Raymond Burr, who plays the killer Lars Thorwald, uh, that he, he chopped up his wife and put her in some suitcase. And I kind of got it. My folks thought I wouldn't get it at the age of, of five. Turns out years later, that character... Um, kind of turned into what my dad looked like many, many years later. So that was horrifying, but it was a lifelong thing. But I remember the power of the images and of the story. I got lost in it. Um, and even at the age of five, you retain that wonder about those moving pictures that never let up. Um, and that went on to my discovery in my early teens of the rest of the world and seeing the world in, in film. And I became a, a glutton for it and never got enough um, and still have not. There are many, many great movies that I hope to see on the big screen with lots of enthusiastic people surrounding me. All right. Well, Elliot, thank you for uh, taking the time to talk with us. I'm going to make sure we have some notes uh, for the DIA's website in our show notes uh, so we can direct people to that. Thank you again, and we look forward to having you on this podcast uh, in person and hopefully for a little bit longer time in the future. Thanks so much, Chris. So that, that seeks into our talk about, I mean, like I said, that was the last movie I saw in theaters, maybe the only movie I'll see in 2020 in a theater, uh, which sucks, <laughs> which I mean, even if that was a great movie, to know that my movie going experience in the movie theaters may have peaked in February that sucks to talk about because I, I, we both are this way. We love going to the movies. I mean, that's why we do this show. So mm -hmm. I, I mean, yeah, I, 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 I'm coming to bummed. I'm really bummed, and I've been reading a lot this week. Uh, other critics are also bummed about it. I know Owen Gleiberman had a really good article, and I think it was Variety uh, about what he misses about going to the movies. And Matt Singer at Screen Crush was writing about it, and uh, it just seemed right just to kick this off with saying. Let's talk about going to the movies, the simple act of seeing a movie in a theater, which I think kind of gets short shrift mm -hmm. these days. So Absolutely. I, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, and I love I love the fact that I can pull something up on Amazon or I have been dipping into the Criterion channel a little bit more. I love that I can do that at home, but it it doesn't replace sitting in the dark with a bunch of strangers having that experience together. It, it never will. And uh so I'm, I'm excited to have this talk. And uh, do you remember? Do you remember the first movie you saw in a movie theater? Uh, I don't know that I remember it. Remember it? I, I I have a vague recollection of the first time ever being at a movie without my parents was I want to say it was Smokey and the Bandit two. Okay. For some reason, I was with people. In my hometown, it was playing my hometown theater, The Strand in Carroll, Michigan, still there to this day, fully operational, two showings a day. I mean, not now, but, you know, generally speaking. And uh, that I remember um, – I mean, I remember walking to the theater because it was, it was literally three blocks from my house. Mm -hmm. I could walk to the theater. And I remember seeing stuff in like 1980. I remember seeing Annie there. 
And uh, I re- I loved it because they had there there was the front of the theater and it was on the corner of a street and down the wall of the building that faced uh, the other street there were three poster uh, cases you know in, inlaid in the wall <laughs> and it was always showing what was coming up. So I knew in one week what was coming, and the poster next to that was the one that was coming in two weeks, <laughs> and the poster next to that was the one coming in three weeks. And I, I, I have so many, uh, I have so many clear memories of the posters from that era, from like eighty to eighty three, that are really burned in my head because I saw them so much, yeah. and I anticipated, and even not anticipated isn't even the right word because they were films that I would have never seen. It like I remember the poster for Raging Bull, literally. Just De Niro's face. Uh, you know, I had no idea what that was in 1980. <laughs> I'm, I'm not claiming I saw it then, and that's what made me a Scorsese fan. No, I had no clue. But I remember that poster. Uh, I remember, you know, the poster for Tootsie super clearly. I remember the poster for Raiders super clearly uh, in those cases. And so, yeah, I have a, I have quite a love for my, for my hometown theater. And uh, that's – it must have been there. But I know that my dad took me to movies in, gosh, when I was four or five. Like I, I do remember seeing the original Chris Reeve Superman in okay. the theater, and I would have been, I would have been five. Okay, that would have been seventy eight. So, uh, and that's that's probably the earliest one that I can that I can recall. I remember the experience of seeing it. Okay, <laughs> yeah, and how much that meant. Uh, that's probably my earliest of okay. being in a theater and and knowing that I have that memory. Yeah, I think for me, I, I have I don't know why I remember the movie because I don't I don't have like a visual memory of it playing on the screen, but I do remember being crammed into our car at a drive-in. Uh, my brother would have been a year old, so he was screaming in the car. <laughs> and the movie I, I believe we were watching it was E.T. I, I, I have a very strong sense that that's what it was. And I, I don't I don't know why, except that that's – I remember my parents, that was the movie they talked about all the time when I was a kid. Like, you love E.T. We took you to see it in the theaters. And I do have another memory of uh, around that same time being in a theater with my dad and just – the memory in me is just that spaceship going up to the sky at the very end of the movie. And uh, I, I like that's uh-huh. like that's the first tangible memory I have of actually seeing something on a screen was watching E. T. And then suddenly the lights come up and it's like, oh, I'm in a theater in Detroit. And uh, like, like <laughs> I remember that that feeling like I was somewhere else and now I'm I'm in the theater. Um, but yeah, I mean the it's, ice bucket challenge of the light coming on and being <laughs> forcibly brought back into reality. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, but yeah, I mean, as we were growing up, I, I, that was the thing we did when we had a family night out. My parents wanted to go to the movies, and as soon as they were allowing us to be dropped off somewhere, it was drop us off at uh, Universal Mall so we could go to the dollar show there. And sometimes we'd go see two or three back to back. Star John R in Madison Heights. I remember when that opened; that was a huge deal. Um, but you remember the posters. I remember Star John R. Uh, the Star Theaters were the first ones I can recall that had video screens inside the lobbies of the theater playing trailers. Oh, cool. And, uh, you know, this was obviously at that point, the internet wasn't a thing, and you couldn't just pull up a trailer on YouTube and watch it whenever you wanted. And, like, Absolutely. that would be your first gl- – like, with posters for you, that would be the first glimpse of a movie for me would be just kind of walking toward the theater but passing a video monitor and all of a sudden, uh, you know, just catching a snippet of a trailer for a new movie and you just kind of stand there for like five minutes and be like, Oh, I got to see this. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it was great. It was like, you know, it was a special treat because your parents are dropping you off. You're out with your friends. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I very early memories of going to the movies and, uh, obviously that had no influence on us whatsoever. So none, um, none. Um, <laughs> one thing that I had down as a question was, uh, and you end our podcast talking with this every week, but where do you usually sit when you go, do you have like a special place? And obviously you usually end the show with this, but yeah, I like for years and years and years. Well, okay. In my younger days, uh, I used to sit in the front row in the center because okay. uh, I, I as I, I at the time I just I just loved being that close mm-hmm. and I liked uh, as I got a little older uh, still young I liked it because I realized oh th- everybody down here is watching the movie 
<laughs> like, like there weren't a lot of distractions down front either. And not that I don't mind the distraction. I, I don't. That's that. That is part of the theater going experience. Uh, but you find yourself around like minded people. I noticed if you were down there. Um, and then one of the very first film classes I had at U of M, the film professor said most that the vast majority of films are shot to be seen in the seventh to tenth row of the theater with your back to the projector. And at that point, I moved to the seventh row. Okay. <laughs> and so that's usually where I try to sit. I try to sit close, uh, but absolutely, I, I will take further back as long as I can get my back uh, to the projector. That's okay. more important to me than where I am in the theater. Okay. Um, I, I think I'm about halfway up is usually where I try to go. I don't. I don't really count rows. But uh, about halfway up on the side because I have a tiny bladder, and uh, <laughs> so so uh, usually that's what, although I did I did notice now that you can buy your tickets online, I always gravitate when I'm buying the tickets online toward the middle of the theater, like center of the theater, um, which I don't know why I do that because then I get nervous the entire movie that I'm going to have to walk <laughs> over someone because I I just know I'm going to have to get up and go to the bathroom. Um, so, so I, I'm probably about halfway up on the right side, unless I'm uh, not really thinking clearly about my bodily needs, and uh, <laughs> you know, then I then I'm dead center, usually, uh, you usually shifting in my seat every five minutes, um, unless I take the kids, in which case it's like two or three rows right by the door because they're gonna go to the bathroom three or four times. Of course, of course. <laughs> so, um. I, I guess the big thing, what do you miss most about going? Like, what about the experience do you love the most uh, of seeing a movie in the theaters? And... Um, you know, I, I, I've said this forever. I mean, I'm not, uh, you know, I, I, I am, there are people who are far more capable than me to talk about the sheer, you know, the sheer level of technical wonder and brilliance of seeing the projected image mm -hmm. i don't i mean I, I i have that to a degree but i don't have to the degrees other people can what i miss most is and, and i think i think i've said this before here what i love about going to the movies and why it is for me and i i think i've said this too and i never say it to offend i, I hope i don't offend by saying this going to the movies is is going to church for me mm -hmm. and it is because it is it forces you to pay attention. You can't stop it. This is the thing that that is the that is the the one absolute hard and fast difference to me from seeing a movie at home and seeing a movie in the theater. Sure, I might be able to get through a whole movie at home without stopping it, but I could. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't have to pay attention. If I'm in a movie theater, I have to pay attention. I am. I, there is nothing else. <laughs> I have to give myself over completely to this mm -hmm. and uh and it's that act of of selflessness of getting out of yourself uh uh mentally that is that's that's what it is for me that's why I love it and why I don't think I I don't believe in the doomsayers who say there'll be no more theatrical that's that's not going to stop it might really change there might not be the same number and types of movies all the time being shown in theaters that we'd like to see, but there will always be an experience like this. Yes. You will always go watch a filmed story <laughs> until the end of time. I, I believe this will stop. So uh, that's that's what I miss. I miss I miss being forced into that position. You know what? <laughs> willingly putting myself in that position where I am forced to experience it rather than I, you know, I, I like you said, I love going through the Criterion stuff at home. It's just a joy. I've watched so much stuff, but yeah, I can pause it. <laughs> yeah, no, um, you know, Matt Singer at, at Screen Crush, he was t writing about this this week, and so on Twitter he was asking people, you know, what what do you miss most about the movies? What's your favorite part of the movie? And uh, I, I thought about it, and I'm like, you know what I miss? And it, it's such a little thing that I probably didn't even think about it until I thought about it. It's that moment the lights dim and suddenly everything <laughs> else, everything else is shut off. You know, all the conversation around you in theory shuts off and uh, it, it's just it's time to focus your attention on the screen and the rest of the world. Like, I, I don't have it as fully as I did when I was a kid where I literally felt like, oh, I am transported somewhere else. But, you know, for two hours, 
I'm just forcing my attention on that. And like you said, I, I at home, I can turn it off. I can pause. I can pull up something to tell me how much time is left on the movie. I can make myself a sandwich. Um, but at, at the theater, I gotta, I gotta just give everything to that, except for when I have to pee. Yeah. But uh, no, I, I mean, and and really, like, I feel as much as I've liked doing the Criterion stuff. I, I can recall, I, you know, I'll sit home and I'll watch that. I still feel like I am going to be more swept into that if I'm watching it in a dark room with strangers on a big screen. Um, I took a few film classes over to grad school at Wayne State, and I had seen Citizen Kane before several times. But we turned off the lights in a big screening room and watched it on the screen, and it was a totally different experience for me. It was yeah. just losing myself in that was was fantastic. Um, yeah. But but thinking about this, the other thing I miss, though, and I, it's not been something we've heard in a while. You remember when you used to sit down or, like, there was a quiet part in the movie and you could hear the projector? Oh, yeah. I, I, I miss that. Like, that was a they, – they don't – obviously don't do that anymore. But unless you see, like, a 75-millimeter film. But, uh, yeah, yeah, I miss that. Um, just stupid things. Smell of popcorn. I miss that. Uh, my wife is actually making popcorn <laughs> for the kids right now while they watch a movie, and uh, it just—it's not the same. It's not the same at home. I thought it was pretty savvy that I saw that uh, Imagine was—I uh, don't know if they're still doing it—but they were opening a couple days a week just to sell popcorn. I saw that. I saw you several could... theaters. Yeah, <laughs> pretty genius. Yeah, pretty that, genius. that's pretty great. Pretty great. I remember we used to go into uh, when I was a kid. It was uh, it was the main theater in Royal Oak, which is now an art theater. But back when I was a kid, it was just kind of like a one or two screen general theater. But I remember you used to walk into that lobby, and it was dark, and it was just an almost suffocating smell of fresh popcorn. <laughs> and I loved that smell. And I'm not even a popcorn guy, but uh, I loved that smell. Uh, yeah, it was great. Um, there's a few other questions I have. I feel like... We might touch on them in our uh, our main discussion, which is we wanted to go down our favorite theatrical experiences. So why don't we get into that, and then if we have more to talk about after, we can we can do that. But uh, I'm excited Sounds about good. this list. So uh, yeah, I mean, I, w- may- I wonder if maybe we hit on some of these when we did our cinematic DNA episode. Maybe not, um, but I- I'm really excited to hear these, and I, I think it's going to be fun. Um, what was your first? What's the first one on your list? Well, I wanted to, as always, I like to explain my criteria here. Sure. And what I really wanted to go for was, this is not about the movie. Mm-hmm. This is, I mean, it is a little, of course, it can't not be. But that's not what I'm talking about when I'm talking about these three stories. These are moments that could only have happened in a theater. And happened uh, for the better because they were in theater and have always stuck with me because they... They made me realize something, uh, oh, uh, at least with two of them. One of them is just an amazing experience of being in a crowd and watching a crowd react. And let's start with that one. Okay. I'll start with that one. The, uh, the most, the most, uh, I, 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 so it's, it's Moulin Rouge. It's Baz Luhrmann's Moulin Rouge. Okay. When okay. I saw that in the theater, which I saw opening weekend, uh, in a theater in Ann Arbor, uh, in a packed theater. And I was excited for it. I had, I was, I was eager to see this. I liked Baz's earlier films. Uh, I was intrigued by the entire idea, and it was. Pl- and I was in my usual. I was, I was probably, I was up close. I remember uh, in that front area of seats before they get into, you know, before they started, before the before the stadium seating kicks in. I'm sure I was in that front section, uh, surrounded by, uh, to my memory, a lot of college age girls. Okay. <laughs> I was a little older by that point. This is I was I was I was out of college for a few years at this point, uh, and absolutely loving the movie. Fifteen twenty minutes in, I was I was all in. I think it's a spectacular piece of work. Um, and for some reason, I don't know if I heard noises or I looked around and I saw like three different elderly couples leaving the theater. <laughs> and I realized, oh, oh, people are not having the same experience. <laughs> That's fascinating. I had never, 
I had never considered that this wouldn't be playing for some. I mean, I can understand it liking it, but I never thought that it would drive you from the theater. <laughs> and then I thought, oh, no. All right. No, I can see. I can see how this might be overwhelming. And it didn't, you know, it was it was a quick blip. And I, I continued enjoying the movie. And then and this is a complete spoiler. I'm not that you can really spoil Moulin Rouge, but come on, people, you've had 20 years. This at the end of the movie uh, in the, you know, it's this it's this just sensorial overload experience of music and sound and really fast editing, uh, just throwing things at you constantly that you have to take in. And then they do that to lead to the end of the movie where it's these incredible close ups of the two leads with black backgrounds. You are just watching death and mourning on their faces and it happened. I was like, Oh, it's so smart. It's so good. I just, I loved how Lerman had constructed the whole film to get to this point. And I looked around and all of those college age girls that are all around me are sobbing <laughs> and not, not the theatrical, you know, they're not, it, it is not a performative thing. They are truly just having a cathartic <laughs> emotional experience of this. And, uh, it just, it put me in awe of the film all the more. It's one of those moments where, you know, you, uh, you know, uh, were I writing about the film, it would have had an effect on it. Even if I didn't like the film, I would have had to have had written something about how, oh, this plays though. You know what I mean? But yeah. it works for me anyway. Uh, and I think it, that's the most, that, that, that is the most, just, I can't even explain it. Just, it's, it's, the, it's the, the most intense reaction I've ever been in with an audience as a whole at a movie. And that's why it has always stuck with me. Wow. I have a very similar experience, except that I didn't like the movie I was seeing. Um, but <laughs> I saw, I went to a press screening a few years ago for um, the fault in our stars. And uh, I, I don't know have you, you've, maybe you've seen it. Um, I have you know, seen it. A teen weepy, um, which I, I don't remember hating it. I just remember it knowing like, this is not, yeah, you know, it's just not connecting with me the same way it might, its intended audience but its intended audience was in the theater and i was surrounded in that theater by about 200 teenage girls <laughs> and i remember at the climax of the movie or whatever the big emo I, this movie has totally escaped my brain but the the big emotional high point of the movie it looked like there were waves going through the crowd and I could just hear, like, shuddering. And I look around, yeah. and there are 200 16-year-old girls just flat out sobbing. Like, yeah. so there are, there, you know, their, their chests are heaving, their shoulders are shaking. And, it, you know, the movie may not have worked for me, but it impressed me that this many people were having this reaction. And I'm like, wow, that is amazing to be in the middle of this. And see it happening around me. I kind of wish it was having the same effect on me. <laughs> but I remember walking out of the theater. And the screening reps are there, of course, to ask, you know, what did you think of the movie? And I think I just kind of, you know, <laughs> made, made some comment. I'm like, eh, you know, it didn't really work for me. Da, 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 da. And I swear about 50 of those girls heard me. <laughs> and shot me the <laughs> nastiest looks you could ever, uh, you could ever imagine. But... And that is why you only have nine fingers to this day, Chris. They yep. took off a pinky. <laughs> yes, yes, I needed yes. that pinky. <laughs> to mark you as the heretic you are. Yes, I understand. Um, you know, the, the, the one I'm going to start off with on the list, though, is uh, it's kind of – it, it's a similar reaction because it's, it's being part of an emotional reaction in the theater, but totally different. Um, a, a totally different type of movie. Uh, it was when I saw There's Something About Mary for the first time. Oh, uh -huh. And I remember it was just on a whim. Uh, you know, my, my friend and I were like, well, what should we do tonight? We're like, oh, you know, There's Something About Mary. It's supposed to be kind of funny. Um, you know, we liked Dumb and Dumber, so let's go see that. And we got to the zipper scene. Yep. And it was one of those things where I... You know, I I think that joke is so perfectly timed, and it, it's just carried out. It is one of my favorite comedic moments in any movie, just the way that joke builds and builds. And I can just remember the giggles starting 
and I we're not you know we weren't in a very big theater. It was a theater of maybe about fifty to seventy five people, and uh, I can remember just you you hear people chuckling like randomly chuckling, and then it would build, and suddenly people are laughing harder, and so you're starting to laugh a little bit harder. And then it just builds and builds till you know there's the big reveal of him stuck in that zipper and the big close up of it. Yes. And it was like bedlam in the movie theater. It was. <laughs> it was. I. I still to this day don't know if I have ever laughed that hard. And it was just. I remember laughing to the point that tears are coming out of my eyes. I'm doubled over. But then I can hear my friend next to me laughing. I can hear the people on the other side laughing. I'm laughing harder. <laughs> then it would die down, and someone else would start laughing, and you'd start laughing harder. In the theater, you couldn't hear the movie because everyone was <laughs> laughing so hard. And uh, it was just one of those experiences. I, I don't know that I've ever laughed that hard in a movie theater. And just to be in a crowded theater with that much joy around you was like it, – it's like a high. It's – it is one of my favorite things is when a movie can just make me laugh that hard. And that does not happen often, but that's great. And, and I've noticed if I'm watching a comedy at home, it's very rare that I'll laugh very hard. Even if I like the movie, I have to be in that crowd with like hundred other people to hear them laughing because we're feeding off each other in that moment. And I think <laughs> there's a part of us recognizing how silly we look and how silly it is that we are, basically laughing at light on a screen and it's just it's so joyous it's it's that shared laughter it's just so so joyous <laughs> and uh yeah yeah i i mean I, that's that that that's an experience i keep chasing i, I can't remember the last time that's happened in the theater um that's and, great. And, and i mean there's so many great crowd moments like i, I considered the avengers for this because i remember the crowd like breaking into cheers for five five different points when i was watching the avengers but i'm like no the laughing is the thing that that made, gave me the most joy. Just laughing that hard, <laughs> um, and I've never laughed that hard again. And the Ferrelli brothers have never been that good again. So, uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they've been fine. Oh, they've, they've, they've 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 had there, their moments. That's okay. It's, they've had their nitpicking. moments. We're nitpicking. Yes, spots. yes. But uh, but yeah. What's your number two? Uh, my number two is so you know what. I, the reason that, you know, we, we've been dancing around it, but the reason that we love this is that, you know, when you're at the theater and it's dark and you're around people, but you're basically alone, you're reacting mm -hmm. to the thing. You're not in dialogue with the people around you. And I don't mean talking. I mean, you know, you're not – maybe you might laugh at something a little hard you know, to indicate how much you really liked it, but you're not consciously doing that. You're just reacting. You're giving yourself over to it. And uh, a memorable moment for me was uh, <laughs> when, when I realized I had to stop having the reaction I was having <laughs> um, for, uh, and this was at the Toronto Film Festival at, at a screening of Dallas Buyers Club. At a very specific moment in Dallas Buyers Club, if you remember the film well, uh, Matthew McConaughey's character gets arrested uh, – or not arrested, but he's detained by officials coming back over from Mexico. And he's got a, you know, a satchel full of drugs and a booklet full of, of, of uh, prescriptions mm -hmm. that he's supposedly filling. And that's how this is all going to be legal. That's how he's going to be able to bring this stuff across. And it's this incredibly dramatic scene. Where they've got him in this, you know, scary booth at the at the airport, and they're flipping through uh, the cops are flipping through the the prescription list thing, and they're reading off names, and it's like, and I may have some of these names wrong, but it's like Drew Pearson, Everson Walls, and I from the first name, do start laughing, <laughs> and I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that it's possible. That in this theater at the Toronto Film Festival, I may have been the only person who would have this knowledge at the front of their head. I knew Drew Pearson was a member of the Dallas Cowboys at that time. <laughs> the Dallas Cowboys are my favorite football team, <laughs> as was Everson Walls. And that's the joke in the scene is that he says like four or five of these names. And it's revealed later in the scene that they're all members of the Dallas Cowboys. They're all fake names just to add to the prescriptions. Mm. But you don't know this in the moment. 
And I was about to let out a huge laugh on the first name. And I realized in, in, you know, in a fraction of a second, all this came through my head. Oh my God, that's so funny. Oh my God, if I laugh real loud, A, I'm going to give away the joke and B, I'm going to sound like a total asshole. Oh my God, <laughs> they're going to think I'm on the cop side. And I shut down. I have never, ever contained a laugh in a movie theater before. Like, like it's something that was supposed to be funny. I don't want to say I haven't, I've contained laughs at serious moments didn't play well that I wanted to laugh at. That's a different kind of laughter suppression. That's not what I'm talking about. So that is, I remember not reacting to something the way I wanted to for the sake of everybody else around me and maybe just a little for myself so I wouldn't look like a total <laughs> asshole. And I can't remember any other time that's happened and I can't remember – I can't think of another experience watching a movie where that would happen. <laughs> I, I have sat with you in several movies or sat in the same movie with you several times and you laugh a lot in movies. And it is great. <laughs> I'm an easy laugh. You have a very infectious laugh in the movies and it's always really fun to watch. Uh, I think – uh, you were sitting right next to me when we saw um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and, yeah. and I just remember that made the movie so much better because just seeing how much you were enjoying that, uh, it was, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, mine's definitely not like that because uh, I went back to – this one's back from my childhood. Um, in June – it was June 1993 – I was in middle school. I was. It was the summer I went between middle school and high school, and there was no better age to be to see Jurassic Park than that <laughs> age. Uh, when you are a 13-year-old boy s- sitting in the movie theater watching dinosaurs, um, I and Jurassic Park is still to this day one of my favorite movie-going memories. Um, it, it was. I remember there was a build up to this for about a week for me, a week or two. Uh, it was the first movie where I made my mom take me to a theater earlier in the week so that I could buy tickets for me and my friend to go back that <laughs> Saturday and see it. Um, and we went back on a Saturday afternoon. It was the day after opening day. And I remember we went and sat and watched Jurassic Park. And I just remember that was the first time I feel like I noticed – of what a movie was doing to get a reaction out of me. Like I could notice what Spielberg was doing with, you know, building up to that T-Rex attack with the rumbles in the background and that, that bottle of water starting to shake. And that was the first digital sound movie I'd ever seen. So the theater walls are shaking. And I remember watching that and knowing, okay, he's building suspense. I'm supposed to be getting scared. But the thing is, is it was working. And I remember it was, I'm in this freezing cold air conditioned theater and I'm starting to sweat because I am so on the edge of my seat as this T-Rex is coming towards the car. And I just, I, I remember for two hours, I don't remember moving or breathing or anything, just going through this experience where these dinosaurs are, you know, trying to kill everyone. And, uh, but I just remember being so taken into that, like being aware of, Every trick Spielberg was throwing at me and not caring because it was so working on me in that moment. (laughs) And it was the first time I wanted to get out of a movie and turn around and go right back into it, which I didn't do. But I went back. I I went back seven times that summer to go see Jurassic Park. And what was great was I would start bringing people with me who hadn't seen the movie yet. And you could just, you know, by that point you knew when all the big moments were. And I would just stop watching the movie and I'd start watching my friend. Like when, uh, when Laura Dern is like crawling through the, through the power shed and she's turning on the lights and I know, oh, this is where the Raptors going to come out and they're going to scream and it's going to be so great to watch. And of course they would scream and it was great to watch. And, I just like that was the first movie to just sink its claws into me, so to speak, and uh, just really like make me in love with the fact that oh, I know this is fake. I know how they made these dinosaurs. I know how they're making me scared. I know how he's pulling up <laughs> suspense. I don't care because this is some sort of magic that I know it's working on me. And uh, mm-hmm. I still, if they are if they are playing Jurassic Park on a big screen anywhere, and they do it every five to ten years when it has an anniversary, I will make sure I go out of my way to go see Jurassic Park on a big <laughs> screen because uh, I, I love that movie on a big screen. 
Um, and I am so glad that it's the only Jurassic Park movie they ever made, and we don't ever talk about any other <laughs> Jurassic Park movies. So, uh, so uh, no, I mean Spielberg has like the, the he, all the big movie going moments of my life. I feel like were Spielberg movies. Like ET was the first movie I saw. Jurassic Park, the first movie that really kind of worked on me. Saving Private Ryan's the first time I ever had like a sobbing breakdown in a theater. Um, but Jurassic Park, that's that's the that's the height of it for me. That's excellent. That's excellent. Uh, 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 for me, that Spielberg film is Raiders. Oh. I saw Raiders of the Lost Ark seven times in the theaters, which is impressive because I was only seven years old the summer it was out. So it wasn't <laughs> like I was driving myself. <laughs> it's That's the only time I have ever sat through a movie twice in a row in the theater. Oh, My wow. parents dropped me off. And you could do that back then. It was the, the multiple, they didn't care. You paid, you just stayed. And I, I literally watched the movie twice back then because they knew I wanted to. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they probably did other stuff. Uh, Raiders is probably, on any given day, that's my top two or three movie of all time. And uh, <laughs> I remember when they were opening one of the Imagine theaters here years ago. I think it was the Imagine Novi. They were doing a test run that week. And every movie you saw would be free because they were training the staff. But they were they were old movies. And so a friend and I were looking for something to do. And we just kind of saw, oh, Raiders of the Lost Ark is playing at 8. Let's go see that. And uh, that's another one that anytime they're playing that on a big screen, I'm, I'm making my way out <laughs> to see that. I, I love Raiders. Uh, what's number Excellent. three for you? So, oddly enough, I'm going to go back to about the same age as, as your story. I'm going to okay. go back to I was 13 or 14. Uh, I don't remember specifically. But, and again, this is not about the movie. This is about the movie-going experience. Uh, I, I teamed up with some uh, some friends of mine, a group of us, headed down to, to the Strand, my local hometown theater, to go see Three Men and a Baby. Okay. The movie's not terribly important. <laughs> if you remember at the time, if you were alive, it was a gigantic hit yes, movie. Yes, it was. It was a <laughs> top grossing movie that year. But uh, I was going with a bunch of friends, and uh, one of the people in this pack of friends was a girl who I had a crush on at the time. Okay. Uh, an unannounced crush. Uh, uh, and I, I, I managed to finagle it, so I was sitting next to her as the movie started. And... Um, you know, let's say I'll steal from my favorite uh, Bruce Springsteen song and say that this girl, she wasn't a beauty, but she was all right. <laughs> and in the movie theater, I looked over at one point to see how she reacted to something or whatever. And she looked like the most pretty I'd ever seen her. Like I was like startled, like, <laughs> like she looked differently pretty than she normally looked to me. Uh and that always stuck with me. And I could not figure out what it was. It wasn't the movie making me feel romantic. Sure, I was coursing with 13 and 14-year-old hormones. That could explain it enough. But it always sort of stuck stuck with me. Like, it was – it really – it marked – I've written about it a couple different times over the years. And then it was uh, it was years later uh, at college, at a film class, when I learned about, uh, about how cinematographers bounce light that mm-hmm. you don't want to put – direct light on a subject that the light is much more complimentary if you bounce it and i realized oh shit so the movie projects that light onto the screen and the light that hits the screen bounces off and hits us and that we sit there and watch these people that are being shot with bounced light looking more beautiful than humans can and that image is bounced back on us and makes us look better than we could possibly look otherwise. And I realized how beautiful and myth-making the entire idea of going to the movies is in that moment. (laughs) That it is an ideal dream factory, literally and figuratively, both for the movies and how you can be and how you can look when you're at the theater. And uh, that's always always stuck with me. To learn that was to, to realize, gosh... The theater is just a magical place. Yeah. <laughs> it really is. And I hate, I hate not being there. <laughs> I, I cannot wait for the theaters to open again. It's, I, I mean, it's amazing that the uh, romantic appeal of Tom Selleck and Steve Gutenberg uh, chasing a baby with heroin <laughs> in its diaper. Uh, <laughs> you know. But yeah, yeah, no. Know, that, that, that's a great, I, I, would, I would read that as a short story, Perry. <laughs> that that's really well, great. I love that. That that is a great story. 
Um, Thank you. Did, did you end up then, like, did every date you had to go on with anyone after, was it always, like, the movie? And they're like, why aren't you watching the movie? Why are you watching me? Or No. It, <laughs> <laughs> it never got that creepy. Because all the girls that I really liked either knew I was into this or were also into it. So okay. it wasn't a problem. It was every, everybody. Who didn't? Who doesn't want to go to the movies? Come on. Especially when you're a teenager. You know, this it's, is, it's, it's the place to go. What's crazy is now as I'm thinking about it, my wife and I very rarely did a movie date. Now that I think about it, it's very weird. I, I think our second date was a movie, and that there weren't many after that. We, I think it was because she's like, if you go to the movie, you're just going to talk about the movie all night. And uh, <laughs> But yeah, th- that, that's, that's neither here nor there. It was just a thought that came into my mind. Um, but yeah. no, that, that's great. That's That's incredible. Um, mine, mine is definitely, I'm going to go sappy with this one. Um, mine is from just a few years ago and it is big hero six. Um, Oh, okay. And the reason that it's one of my all time favorite movie going moments is that is the first movie I took my son to. And uh, yeah. he was two, he was almost three. And I remember kind of debating like we were i was debating back and forth like i really wanted to take him to his first movie and we were kind of like well would he sit through it would he is he a little too young for this we don't know we don't know but uh we had disney channel on at our house and he kept reacting to the big hero six commercials and you know every time he saw you know the baymax robot he would just kind of go nuts and he'd uh he'd scream and like point at it and laugh so I was like, all right, well, I'll take him to that. And I remember I planned it out because, you know, there was a concern he was going to cry or something. So I'm like, we're going to go to the first movie on a Saturday. We'll go to like a 10 o'clock show. So I brought him into the theater. He thought it was awesome because I bought him his own little popcorn and his mm-hmm. own pop, which he wasn't drinking a ton of pop. <laughs> so I remember uh-huh. we, we walk into the theater and we sit down. And uh, the theater now, it's the uh, Laurel Park Place uh, Phoenix Theaters. But now they have recliners. But at that point, they still had, you know, the typical theater seats, which would flip up if you got up. Well, he tried sitting down. He was a little too light for it. And it kind of flipped him back. So he, like, as soon as he sits down, he's flipping back in his seat and trying to figure out why his chair is doing this. I'm like, all right, I've... I guess I've kind of ruined this experience, but uh, it it was funny, you know, the lights go down and I was just, I was watching him the whole time. Just like, how is he going to take to this? And the lights go down and I know he's getting a little apprehensive and the trailers start and he's just not sure. Like there's this giant screen, like tossing, like you said, like bouncing light off him. But to him, it's like tossing light in his face, just (laughs) at a size he's never, he's never seen before. And I could just see him kind of at first kind of taking it back. The sound was so loud. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be awful. I brought him too young to this. He's going to be so overwhelmed. He is going to hate this. And then I don't know if you remember, but Big Hero 6 started with the um, the short Feast. Feast. Which is a I, – I, I still – we had, we own that. I, I bought that on Google Play just so occasionally I could watch it with the kids because I love that. That's a yeah. a great little little short. And I remember that. It, it, it made my top – Ten that year. Oh, really? Feast did. I think not I big hero six, that. but feast did. Yeah, yeah. It's it's such a great little short, and it's so perfectly pitched at a kid. Uh, like he doesn't understand the dating whole everything going on in the background, but he just understands there's this dog who's hungry and getting food. And I remember his eyes just locked on the screen at that point, <laughs> and he was he was laughing, and he was taking it in, and then big hero six, six starts, which. I, I enjoy it. I think it's a fun little movie. I, I liked it. I had a good time with it. We pulled up on Disney Plus and watch it. But, oh my gosh, for him, I just remember his jaw was open. About 15 minutes in the movie, he climbs out of his little seat. He scampers up into my lap, and he just sits there for the next hour and a half. And he doesn't say <laughs> a word. He doesn't move. <laughs> He sits there through the entire end credits because I knew there was a post credit sequence. And uh, uh-huh. I just remember he just – he sat there quietly and just kind of watching it. And we get up to leave and I remember he's just like, I like that one. And uh, <laughs> and uh, it it was so – 
it was so great. It was his first piece of film criticism, but uh, I like that one. It, it was great, and it was just one of those things where I'm like, I, you know, I, I ended up writing a blog entry about it, and it was like, you know, such a saccharine point to end on. But I was like, I like that one too, buddy. But it was that whole experience. It's just like watching him, like sharing this thing that means so much with me to me, sharing it with him, and then watching him, like watching him take it in for the first time, and just seeing how big and overwhelming and consuming it can be but how once we lock on that story we just were we're hooked and uh to this day that's like you know like i said uh the last movie i probably will have seen this year is a movie i saw with him and uh <laughs> he that's that's our thing my my daughter she she's okay with going to the movies she you know likes to get up and dance during it but uh for him, he that is his favorite thing is when we can go to the movies together, and uh, it, it was great. That's that's probably one of my top mo- moments of all time was sitting in the movie theater, taking him. So that's uh, that's beautiful. That is the uh, the story of my, uh, me taking my oldest Emma to her first movie is very similar, <laughs> very very similar for us. It was Spy Kids. Okay, and uh, yeah, she sat down on my lap. I bought, and it was when. Uh, it was a local multiplex that was doing like uh, free kid movies, like Saturday morning at 10 a.m., like a new one, a different one every Saturday. Uh, and so that's why we took her because we thought, well, we don't want to waste eight dollars on a ticket for something she might not sit through. She was four or so at the time. And same story. I bought a little popcorn, pop, and a, for an hour because they they would they would throw an intermission into these so, to encourage you to buy more popcorn. Okay. And literally. For an hour until that animation happened, she did not take her eyes off the screen, and her hand never stopped moving from a popcorn <laughs> container into her mouth. Just non-stop yep. zombie-like attention to popcorn and movie. <laughs> it was beautiful. It's beautiful. My son still like if if we go to the movies and we don't ha- get popcorn, it's like not a complete experience for him. Um, <laughs> I will. I will off and, and and it's come back to bite me. Um, I remember I took him to see a screening of um, it was whatever the last Spider Man live action Spider Man movie was last summer, and we were running really late for the screening, so we basically get there. There's a line like down the hall for the popcorn. So I'm like, now, nah, bud, we just gotta we just gotta get in and sit. And I remember looking over at him. We got about five minutes till the movie starts. He's sitting next to me. And he's just bursting into tears because he had his heart <laughs> so set on popcorn that I'm like, as soon as the movie started, I ducked out, ran down the hall, came back with a little bag for him. And uh, <laughs> uh, gosh, I, and, you know, but of course on the way home, I'm like, you know, when I was your age, I didn't get popcorn at the movies. And <laughs> still, don't, still don't get popcorn at the movies. What do you, what do you eat at the movies? Are you a snacker? Uh, now, no, not anymore. Uh, it really, and I don't know when that changed. Uh, I mean, as a teenager, of course, popcorn, of course, popcorn. But uh, I, I hit it's it's two things. I hit I, uh, I hit a diminishing returns with popcorn. I hit at some point in my thirties where it just wasn't worth the trouble of picking it out of my teeth for the satisfaction mm-hmm. I got out of eating it anymore. Um, so I really don't eat much popcorn. Uh, ever anymore but on top of that it's uh and this if i'll hear i'll hear dr freud allow me to lay down i i i have some issues around food <laughs> i i i i eat for many reasons that have nothing to do with being hungry or needing nutrients <laughs> <laughs> um and honestly movies sort of like i said that that whole thing of having to get out of yourself and focus on this other thing take that out of me i don't have the, the urge to eat at a movie I don't – there's nothing that needs filling. I don't I don't have to satisfy any other sort of weird Freudian subconscious need. The movie takes care of it. <laughs> <laughs> the wow. movie suckles me enough, Chris. Wow. So really, I, rare, I rarely eat at the movie. Maybe once in a while, just, for, just to be a treat, I'll get something – I'll get sweet. I'm, I, I have a fondness for, for cookie dough bites. Okay. I'll, I'll confess to you. I'll, I'll, I might be buy a box of those once a year for a movie that I – I think will be enhanced by such a sugar rush. But uh, generally speaking, no. I generally don't eat during a movie. The exception being, no, man, if you ever make it to an Alamo draft house, eat and drink and have fun. <laughs> oh, please do not bring up Alamo draft house because my dreams got dashed. My wife, a few years ago, when they had one out in uh, Kalamazoo, 
She yes. bought me. She bought me a gift card because I had said all like I had told her. I'm like, there's this theater out in the Austin area, and you can get beer and food and watch the movies. And they they program the the, the you know special movies and stuff. And if I ever get the chance, I'm going to an Alamo Draft House. So they opened the one up in Kalamazoo, and uh, she got me a gift card for Valentine's Day one year. And we kept saying. We're going to plan a weekend. We're going to go out to Alamo Draft House. going to plan a weekend, go out to Alamo Draft House. And uh, then they closed the Alamo Draft House in Kalamazoo. Oh. But then they announced, oh, we're going to open one in Midtown Detroit. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I work in Midtown Detroit. This is fantastic. And then <laughs> late last year they announced, yeah, no, they're not going to do that. Not going to happen. Uh, so yep. so my, my hope is somewhere in Metro Detroit, Metro Detroit or Ann Arbor, there's got to be a place – for an Alamo draft house, and uh, I, if not, I'm, I'm, we're taking a trip to Austin one year, and uh, go. Know, it's, yeah. it's honestly worth it. <laughs> I, I, it, is, it is honestly that great an experience. Hey everyone, Chris again. Before moving to the Detroit area, uh, my wife and I lived in Ann Arbor for a few years. Uh, one of the highlights of that was our visits to the Michigan Theater. Uh, it's in the city's downtown, and in a city known for its culture and love of the arts, the Michigan Theater really stands out. Uh, it's got this gorgeous main auditorium, and some of my favorite film memories of recent years include sitting in that auditorium. Uh, I, that's where I saw my first viewing of Tree of Life, which uh, you might remember I talked about a few weeks ago, or a few episodes ago, uh, with Perry. And it was my favorite film of the last decade, and my first viewing of that was at the Michigan Theater. I remember sitting in awe and watching Werner Herzog's Cave of Forgotten Dreams in 3D, which is really fantastic. Uh, if you ever get a chance, if it ever plays around you again, I know uh, I think IFC is bringing that back to a few theaters. And if you can if you can see that once theaters reopen in 3D, it's really great. Uh, I also remember sitting in a packed house to watch the Muppet movie at the Michigan Theater at a revival screening a few years ago and the Muppet movie on any given day is my favorite movie of all time and seeing it in a packed house is just pure joy. Uh, so just down the street, the State Theater is also part of the Michigan Theater, and it's an Ann Arbor institution as well. It's a great place for indie films and midnight movies. This week, Ariel Wan, uh, the Director of Programming, Marketing, and Sales for the Michigan Theater, was kind enough to connect with our show and talk about some of her favorite movie-going experiences and the offerings at the Michigan Theater during this time. I hope you'll consider viewing some of these films and, when all this lifts, paying a visit to our friends at the Detroit Film Theater and the Michigan Theater. And here is a message from the Michigan Theater right now. Hi, this is Ariel Wan, Director of Programming Sales at the Michigan Theater. Um, I work for the Michigan Theater Foundation, and we... Um, own and operate the Michigan Theater and State Theater in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, what I enjoy most about being in the movie theater, definitely it's a tie between the popcorn with real butter and um, being in a packed house with other people watching the same thing. And, uh, you know, some people might find this kind of annoying, but I really like it when the crowd reacts similarly or even differently. Uh, while watching something on the big screen. And that's just definitely something you don't get from watching movies at home. Um, oftentimes you watch movies at home with just one or two other people. And oftentimes you get really annoyed when someone falls asleep. Hopefully there's not too many people falling asleep at our movie theaters. Um, but definitely my favorite thing is watching movies with other people and sharing the same experience. Um, during this time of temporary closure, uh, our theater is offering a ton of um, virtual events. Um, there are some new art house films that are not available yet to rent through the normal channels. So we've been uh, working with distributors to offer these to be rented and screened at the comfort and safety of your own home. Um, right now, we are showing um, a really fantastic film, award-winning film called Beanpole, and uh, it was on the shortlist for an Oscar nomination um, from Russia for Best Foreign Film. Unfortunately, it didn't make it, uh, but it's still um, a great movie to watch. It's very sad and depressing, but um, the storylines, the characters, it's just, you know, 
it's no wonder it won a few awards at the Cannes Film Festival. We're also um, showing Cat Video Fest, The Best Of. Uh, this has always been a really popular film in the theaters. Uh, we would get hundreds of people coming in to watch the best cat videos uh, curated from all around the world. And this is a very short 40-minute Best Of video. Um, you can pay as you want. Um, we have a recommended price, but uh, it's available for as little as you know, 99 cents, or if you're feeling very generous, uh, you know, donate whatever you can. All of these uh, first uh, first run, as we call it, or new films that we're offering, um, a percentage, usually 50%, goes directly to our theater, which is a really great way to support um, your theaters. I know other theaters in the country are also doing similar. The ones that are still able to be quote unquote open during this time and um, one other thing that we're doing that's really unique is uh, we've been doing these silent films with live at-home organ accompaniment by our head organist, Andrew Rogers. Uh, we did the Ten Commandments, the 1923 Ten Commandments um, on Easter Sunday, and you know we had a couple hundred people view the film. We're now working on some other silent films that are available on the public domain. Uh, so the next one we have coming up is The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. And so that's going to be released May 1st. And um, it's going to be fantastic. We're actually going to have the recording take place in the Michigan Theater um, using the original Barton organ from 1928. So that's going to be really fantastic really cool to watch on screen. Um, and it's just amazing that Andy can perform to no audience and still have it sync up well. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, you can see all the cool stuff we're doing. Uh, go to mishtheater.org. That's M-I-C-H-T-H-E-A-T-E-R.org. Thanks and stay safe out there. Uh, well, well, I mean, with that, though, do you have a favorite theater you go to or a favorite theater? I mean, you've mentioned The Strand a lot, um, but is there like just a cool theater you've been to or certain theaters you just keep returning to? Or There are, I mean, there are theaters that are very, I mean, you know, The Strand is my home theater. I mm -hmm. have, um, it no longer exists, but the, th the, the closest big city that I grew up near was Saginaw. Okay. And they had, uh, when I was a young man, and by young man, I mean little boy. They had uh, the quad, which was four screens. Okay. That's why it's the quad. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when I was maybe 10 or 9, 10, 11, they became the irrationally titled quad eight. <laughs> <laughs> and then a few years later, they became the quad 12 and the quad 16. And then they got to the really ridiculous quad 20. They're really then, just sticking to that name for no reason. But that was that was great because it was such. This was the late '80s that it was mm -hmm. there, so I was still in high school, and it was so many screens, and it was not like it is now. They booked indie stuff. They booked oh, wow. foreign stuff. Like they was. I saw. I saw the re-release of Belle de Jour there, the, <laughs> the Bunuel film. I mean, I saw. I saw um, uh, uh, a little princess. The, uh, there. It's, I mean, I just, I saw so many, and then eventually, like, they split it and they made six theaters, dollar theaters, and they had, like, 14 screens of first release and six dollar oh, wow. screens of second release. Um, and so I spent a lot of time at the quad, uh, a lot of time seeing movies at the quad. And then, of course, when I came to school in Ann Arbor, uh, you know, once you once you've seen a movie at the Michigan Theater, yes, you really don't want to see a movie anywhere else. No. I, I I did consider telling I, I I did consider this story. I didn't think it was as good as the other three, but now that we're on it, I will tell it. My first movie at the Michigan Theater. I actually saw a concert at the Michigan Theater when I was in high school. Before I ever saw a movie there, I saw the Cowboy Junkies okay. with uh, Towns Van Zant opening uh, at the Michigan Theater. But the first movie I saw there, which was my I think the the opening the, like the first weekend I was at school was Madonna's Truth or Dare documentary. Oh, wow. And I I don't care about the documentary other than the experience that it was the first time I ever got to sit in a balcony. I yeah. never got to sit oh. in a balcony for a movie before. And we're up there, and the balcony's packed, and it's great, and the crowd is raucous. Everybody's having a good time. And I'm talking with my buddy, and he says, hey, look behind you. And I look across the aisleway, and there's this guy, this, like, six-foot-four Burly dude with like a thick black 
uh, 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 beard and mustache, just, you know, lumberjack looking dude, right? Mm. In a full white bridal gown. <laughs> Absolute bridal gown. That's a great experience. That's awesome. Everybody should have their first college movie experience have that happen to them. This is telling you, this is what you need to do. Oh, that's great. That, 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 the, the, uh, the Michigan theater that was a favorite of mine when we lived in Ann Arbor. Uh, we lived there for about three or four years. And, uh, I think the first movie we saw there was Tree of Life. And I, you know, we've talked about Tree of Life before. That's, that's one of my all time favorites. But I can remember just sitting there in that beautiful auditorium, that movie just washing over me for two and a half hours, just totally caught up, totally enraptured. And I think I've told this story before. It ends. You're waiting, watching this dark screen for the uh, credits to start coming. It's just this long pause. Suddenly, Terrence Malick's name come comes up. And from elsewhere in the theater, I just hear someone else. Sheesh. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> so that moment of knowing not everyone is having the same experience of mine as I am having. <laughs> it's like I, I'm just totally enraptured. And they're just like, finally. And... <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, the one I had growing up, it was, uh, and it just closed. It just literally closed about two weeks ago because of, uh, you know, it was one of the first AMC theaters to be cut because of, uh, COVID-19. Uh, it was the star Southfield, which yeah. if you grew up in Metro Detroit in the late nineties, that was where you went on a, on a weekend night. Um, that opened in 1997, which was the year I graduated high school and I remember going there and having the distinct thought, I can never go anywhere else to see a movie. Um, <laughs> like, I, I, it was, you've, I, I'm sure you've been there. Um, back oh, yeah. In, it, back in its glory days. Uh, it was, it was like nothing I'd seen before. You'd walked in and that, that's, I remember the ceiling was painted like Constellation of Stars and, uh, they had a Johnny Rockets, which I thought was really cool, but it was just this beautifully designed, like almost like a theme park of a movie theater. Like, <laughs> I, I, like in in retrospect, it was probably more like a mall. But I mean, it was just it was overwhelming, and it was the first time I'd been into a theater with uh, stadium seating, and the projection was great, and the sound was great, and I mean, I I saw. I saw so I, I was there every weekend. I would drive out that way, even though it was like a twenty minute drive for me. And uh yeah, I saw Face Off there. I <laughs> I saw Titanic several times there because that was the only theater where you wanted to see Titanic on that giant screen. Um mm -hmm. but, but I remember when the Phantom Menace came out, I waited in line for six hours a week before the movie came out to get tickets for it, and it was the most fun I'd ever had. Uh I won <laughs> tickets to uh, the Adam Sandler movie, The Wedding Singer, to a sneak preview of that. And in the middle of that, like right before that sneak preview began, they married three couples in the theater. Uh, so I was at a weird... Very nice. I was at a weird wedding set to an Adam Sandler movie. Um, that, that was definitely... I was so sad to hear that that had closed. Even though my last few visits over the last few years, it had really kind of run its course. And you know, it, it was not up to its glory days, but it's like every great memory of my 20s of going to the movies was at that theater. Um, the Redford Theater, which is just like two miles from my house. Have you been there? I have not. I need to make this okay. trip. I we, we should go sometime. It's uh, it's great. Redford is a great repertory theater. Um, they will they play. You know, I've seen, you know, a, a repertory in that case, like. Sometimes it's Home Alone is considered the classic. Sometimes Karate Kid, but uh, you know I saw West Side Story there with Rita Moreno uh, getting up and giving a you know a talk in the middle of the movie uh, during intermission. I I saw White Christmas there, which I hate the movie, but it's really it's really fun to sit in there and listen to a bunch of people sing sure. along with White Christmas. Uh, beautiful, beautiful lobby, beautiful. Um, I want to say Sanctuary, which might be given away that I have more of your viewpoint of movies. Uh, but the auditorium <laughs> just has this beautiful Japanese design and they always have an organ right before the, like the, like the uh, Michigan theater does 
always an organ performance right before. Uh, sometimes they do cartoons right before it. Uh, I was really close to convincing my wife to have our wedding there. Nice. Um, <laughs> but, but she did not, she did not go for that. Um, but that's, that's another one I, I love. <laughs> so, and now all this talk has made me just want to go to the movies. Uh, <laughs> all the more. It makes the pang of not having all the pangier. Yeah. And you were saying, you don't think, I, I, I agree with you. I don't think this is something that's going to go away. I don't think people are going to take to say, well, I think I only want to do movies at home now. I, I think people are going to miss that, that feeling of sitting in an audience together. I think whatever that first movie is to come out once they open it back up is going to do huge business. You know, it may very well be that, that this just accelerates what the trend was going to be. We all knew, you know, theatrical is certainly on the downturn, mm -hmm. uh, and this may accelerate that. But even then, it's not going to it's not going to end it. Teenagers will always want to leave the house, yes, <laughs> and therefore there will always be where. As I like to say to people who complain about the price, tell me where else you can pay eight dollars to look at something that costs two hundred million dollars to make. <laughs> doesn't happen anywhere else nope uh, and i remember there was a it, it was going uh around the internet about a week or so ago uh somehow this cell phone footage from someone watching avengers ed game last year was making the rounds on youtube um i don't know if you've seen this but you've I seen not. okay you've seen avengers end game right Yes. Okay. So someone's videotaping the sequence where it's the highest grossing movie in the world. I'm not going to, you know, if I spoil it, you're just behind the curve. But uh, it's the sequence where all those portals are opening and all the Avengers are coming back and Captain America's, you know, Avengers assemble. And someone's videotaping a crowd watching this and they are just going bonkers, like <laughs> screaming and like, oh, my gosh. And I watched that footage so many times because I'm like, I miss that. I miss sitting in a stupid comic book movie, screaming, and I will totally admit it with Avengers Endgame, getting choked up because, oh my gosh, Spider-Man's back. And look, isn't this cool, everyone? This is great. Captain America's having the hammer, and it's uh, it's great. And I, I was just like, I want to be back doing that right now. <laughs> um, and I, I'll tell you what I'd love to see is uh, since we're not getting new theatrical releases anytime soon, since everything's kind of being pushed off, I would love it if some of these theaters open back up and they just start showing old movies for a bit. Which we, can you imagine just going and seeing a nice old crowd pleaser? Is this is such a weird like I don't. Uh, it's part of what I I, I have no idea what this is going to look like. This is unlike anything else I can quite fathom i mean there have been strikes in the past that have shut down production of things mm -hmm. but they kind of knew those were coming and so i, the, I you know this, this it's not like there's going to be a backlog of stuff to come out i mean there will be because the stuff that was done isn't out but it's not like there's anything being produced right now no and so i i i have the same question as you do i don't know if there's going to be granted there'll be less theaters so i don't know <laughs> if there'll be more screens that need to be filled or not but that's the really – that is the really interesting thing to see how far this goes, that if no one's – I also think in about uh, probably, if not next year, certainly the year after, every single film at Sundance is going to be shot to look like it's a Zoom meeting. Oh my that's gosh, yes. That's just going to be everywhere and that will get old real quick. <laughs> I, I mean that's, that's already been something that's been happening. I mean there was a – horror movie unfriended which took place all via social media screens i know there was a movie f out a few years ago called searching that was all yep. done on a laptop but yeah it's all gonna be uh last week's saturday night live episode yes uh, via via screens it's gonna be the horror of a zoom thing and I, maybe there's something that's gonna work with that but i'm not looking forward to 20 movies about zoom uh no you know, no I, not at all I, I hate being on zoom three times a week for uh work meetings but uh exactly. but you know get, what get, filmmakers get away from this now don't don't do this there's gonna be that there is going to be a ton of zombie movies people are writing right now um you, you know that that's gonna be coming there's gonna be a ton of pandemic movies uh see i don't know i don't know that there will be I real I, that's see that's, it's too on the nose. I I don't think there will be. I think it's interesting because I think you will see. 
it, that that is my hope that this will produce this downtime where like a bunch of really great scripts get written not necessarily about so. this just in general just and that maybe you know i i i, you know, I would love to get an insider take on what is going on at disney right now because I, they're i don't see where they make any money no one can go to the parks no one can go to the movies nope I don't see what they can do, and their whole business model is they got to put out movies that cost two hundred million dollars because they've got to make eight hundred million dollars. Yep, and, and they... none of that money's coming in. And so, if that infrastructure collapses, whoo, that opens up uh, that opens up a lot of breathing room. Yeah, <laughs> um, and we will see if if I mean I I'm sure it won't take long for it to get right back in shape. I, I am I am sure that they will dangle all the money in the world in front of all of their favorite Marvel people to come back so, so they can have a few more tent poles real quick to prop up that sagging canopy. But I I I am curious what this does to the landscape. Yeah. Yeah, I mean and are people still gonna be interested like so many of these movies depend on this momentum of coming out every year or two. You need a mar- two or three Marvel movies a year. Are people gonna still feel the same way about a Marvel movie? In, in a year, are people still gonna? I mean, y- yes, I'm still gonna care about the next Fast and the Furious movie because I'm stupidly invested in this series. But uh, are people gonna turn into that? But I do wonder if maybe you know the first movies that we're gonna see back are, are produced are gonna be these indie films that can do it fairly quick, and or are they gonna go? I'll, I'll go to Netflix, and uh, which I believe this week, as we're recording, became a more valuable company than Disney. I remember reading an article about that. Uh, Netflix wow. is now worth more than Disney because Disney is losing $30 million a day because they, uh, you know, like you said, they have amusement parks that are closed. They have shut down all their production. They own a TV station, uh, ESPN, that can't play any sports. And uh, ESPN is hilarious. If you want a good laugh, just every couple days, just randomly pop over to ESPN and check out what they're doing. It's fantastically hilarious. <laughs> uh, is it the Ocho yet? Um, so I flipped over on a key because I, I mean, and again, I, you know, I, I, I am, I am one of the rare breed who I am not sports averse. <laughs> I love sports. I love movies more, but I, I really like sports. And uh, it is, it's hilarious. It is. Uh, one time I flipped over and they were showing an MMA fight from like four years ago, <laughs> featuring people I've never heard of. And then, but what was great about it was they had a scroll going at the bottom. There were no scores to update, <laughs> but they had like some news stories, and then scattered in that were this day in history <laughs> <laughs> on the bottom scroll, Chris. So someone That's is just sitting there. Doing. Someone's sitting there with a wiki page open, updating yep. as they go through. That's that's great. And then another time I flipped over right when Sports Center was on, the flagship news program of ESPN, and um, and I found out later that this is an ongoing thing. But they were showing uh, – they, what they have is they have a bunch of NBA players competing in a, an esports tournament, NBA <laughs> tournament against each other. But Sports Center was literally showing highlights of these electronic games oh my with the Sports Center announcers doing the announcement of the get like covering it as if it's an actual highlight chris wow this is what espn has come down to if i I'm not <laughs> i'm not only gonna watch people play video games i'm gonna watch announcers comment on the action in the video game <laughs> wow if i had if i had cable i would be turning to espn right now just to watch <laughs> that um but i mean at least at least we all have quibi to fill that hole in our hearts um <laughs> I, I, I have watched a Quibi show, and I think I'm good with Quibi's offerings. Uh, <laughs> yes, I don't want 10-minute episodes. No, it's that really... That intrigue me. You know what? I went to the probably with a thing that would be the easiest sell for me. There is a comedy series with Will Forte on there. And so I'm like, you know what? If anything's going to get me looking at Quibi, it's going to be this. And I just got frustrated every 10 minutes when the episode would end, and... I'd be in a new episode. I'm like, well, this just feels exhausting. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and they, they have the wonderful novel thing of you can flip your phone up or down, you know, sideways or, uh, or vertically. And the picture changes based on that. So you can either watch a movie as it's been intended to be seen 
or flip it up and get basically a return to pan and scan. And it's, uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's awful. It's awful. And, uh, I, I need to remember to delete Quibi from my phone. Um, this, pod, right. this podcast episode is brought to you by the fine folks at Quibi. Quibi. Uh, <laughs> Quibi. Well, hey, it's 10 minutes. <laughs> Well, Perry, I don't know about you, but it felt good to talk to another human being who is not part of my immediate family and to talk about movies today. Yes, yes. Th- I'm, I'm so glad that we can start doing this again. I am. I look forward to a I look forward to a nonstop uh, rush of new episodes, everybody. We are we are back. We and... are not going anywhere. And the beauty of this show is even though we're talking movies, we tend to talk about older stuff anyway. So there is no short of, a, of the things we can talk about. Um, so I'm looking forward to being back. I, I This was very much a, uh, a welcome return for me. I'm very happy to be back doing this. Perry, where can people find you? Besides, Well, I'm at partner. home, Chris. Yes. I'm at home all the time, <laughs> Chris. That's all I'm doing. Uh, if you can picture me without my face and no- mouth and nose, you might recognize me at my local Kroger. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm at home, Chris. I'm at home. You can find me on Facebook. You can find me on Twitter at Perry Loves Film. And uh, gosh, you know, I'm around. I'm easy to find. <laughs> if you're a sniper, I'm easy. I'm an easy target. <laughs> I, I How about think, you, Chris? Well, I think snipers can find us all pretty easily right now. They, uh, <laughs> as long as we're sitting in front of our windows, we are uh, we're pretty easy. But uh, you can find me on Twitter at Mere Christianity. Uh, I'm on Facebook, and you can find me reviewing films at um, BHM Pop Culture, uh, which are the fine folks who also put out this podcast. We also do film reviews on that site. Uh, I believe if you read it. Now you can read my uh, wonderfully lukewarm takes on Onward and uh, something else. <laughs> uh, and probably by this point, uh, Trolls World Tour, which is uh, its own special hell. Uh, <laughs> so we will be back, I am hoping, next week with a brand new episode. Perry, I will see you then. Absolutely. Look forward to it.